and welcome back to the PPN Southeast Psychology Expanded podcast. Within this podcast, we aim to give NHS psychological professions a personal voice. We also are excited to hear about the experiences of these people within their roles, how they got there and some of the challenges that they can face. We like to look at the different areas of psychological professions within the NHS and hope to cover a broad spectrum. I'm Mel Ray and I'll be your host for today. The PPN Southeast is a membership network for all psychological professionals and other people who are interested in NHS Commission Psychological Healthcare. You can see our website in the notes below. So in today's episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Adrian Whittington. Adrian is the co-chair to the Psychological Professions Network Southeast Region, and he is also the National Clinical Lead for Psychological Professions within NHS England. Today, we're going to discuss Adrian's role and his journey to gaining gaining entrance into that role. We're going to talk about the different things that he gets involved in and what connects him to his values while he's working in such a senior position. We'll also have a think about what it is that Adrian wish he knew or the advice he'd give to other people starting out in psychological professional roles. So there's a lot to talk about. Let's welcome Adrian Whittington. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No worries. Um, I guess we'll just jump straight in with, can you tell us a little bit about what your role is, what it is that you do? Yeah, of course. Uh, one of my roles is co-chair of the Southeast Psychological Professions Network with the wonderful Bill Tip lady. And um, my other role, which actually occupies most of my week, is um, being National Clinical Lead for Psychological Professions at NHS England. So what that means is um, my mission really is to try and maximise the impact of the psychological professions for the public in a way that's aligned with policy. Um, So it's trying to make the most of our psychologists, psychological therapists, psychological practitioners in a way that benefits the public um, and in a way that lines up with public policy uh, for health and care. That does not sound like an easy feat. It would be great to know what specifically are some of the things that you kind of get involved in yeah in the NHS when we say sort of public policy that feels really like normal language but for a community outside what does public policy mean what does that sort of look like in your role yeah yeah it can sound quite abstract can't it um so I suppose at the policy end of the job the sorts of things I'm involved in are um continuing to uh, work to expand uh, some of our kind of key areas of service where psychological professionals um, deliver. Um, And there's lots of those different areas of service across all different parts of health and care. But some examples are um, NHS talking therapy services. We're currently expanding again, uh, having gained further investment last year. Um, We're currently working to try and expand further psychological therapies for other types of mental health problems as well so psychosis bipolar personality disorder um, eating disorders um so working on the sort of policy uh sort of initiatives that will make that happen in other words seeking um, investment from government um and then delivering if we've been successful in achieving that investment which means um understanding what workforce we need, um, developing and commissioning the training programs that then train people to be that workforce, um, and then uh, sort of ensuring that the kind of um, the way in which those roles are set up and the tasks that people have in those roles are safe and effective. Um, uh, So those are the sorts of things that that perhaps gives a flavour as a sort of policy end. There's a whole range of other sort of different things at the policy end as well that I've been working on. So things like uh, developing new um, guidance on risk assessment and management for the NHS that moves us beyond um, sort of trying to predict risk and into um, thinking much more holistically and in a person-centred way about um, safety. Uh, So those are some examples, but it's really important actually that this role it sort of also builds bridges so it's not just sort of operating in this abstract policy world um 
it's about building bridges with practitioners and with the public. Uh, so I see that as a key element of it. Um, and what that means is making sure that practitioners in the psychological professions have a kind of joined up voice to shape and influence policy, but also to understand and deliver on policy initiatives. And then bridges with the public by making sure we always have that voice of lived experience in all of our initiatives, um, all of our work, so that we're always driven by the needs of the public and making things as good as they can be to deliver for the public. That's always got to be our priority. That's got to be our sort of driving force. Yeah, absolutely. And while while you're kind of explaining all of that, it really made me think about sort of the PPN and the work that the PPN does and how those sort of two almost job roles kind of can really real really align quite well so I guess that's what you do in in that sort of NHS England role are you able to bring that into the PPN co-chair role yeah um absolutely it does connect very closely so Mm -hmm. um in a way the PPNs the psychological professions networks are the kind of regional uh networks that support all of this work Um, And they support it in in a sort of two way direction. So they support it by being a kind of um, vehicle for some of these sort of growth agenda policy initiatives, you know, having more psychological professions. We're on this massive growth curve at the moment. Um, So the PPNs can support that by helping practitioners already in the field to understand it, to be part of it, to to enable that growth. Um, But they also support it by feeding back up some of the kind of realities of challenges and um, also good innovation that the the sort of policy world needs to be aware of. So the two things do really connect and that connects through my sort of Southeast co-chair role, but also because I I also um, sort of meet with regularly all of the PPN chairs in all of the different um, regions of of England. Um, And so there should be that point of connection where where it all all connects. Uh, The the mission is the same. Uh, Yeah. But although we might sort of uh, come at it with different emphasis and different angle. You mentioned the growth of the psychological professions and and we're talking about all of those sort of different boxes on our career map that we sort of mentioned in previous episodes, aren't we? So sort of that entire range of professions or is there a certain focus? No, it's um, absolutely or... about the full range of um, oh. psychological professions. So we think of three main groupings, which are psychologists, psychological therapists and psychological practitioners. But within those, there are actually 21 roles that are on our uh, taxonomy, and most of those now in the career map. Um, And I think it's a really important part of this mission to to have a joined up voice for all of those groups. They're all part of the picture of a more psychological NHS, and um, uh, they need to be pushing in the same direction. And of course, when you have lots of different roles, and some of them are quite new, still being understood how they can best make their contribution, um you can get into a situation where there's a bit of a sense of competition between the roles or people aren't clear how that how they're the same and different um but i think we we've, we've all sort of really needing to work on that synergy between the roles and they're all making an important contribution i think gone are the days when um being a practitioner psychologist is the only way of making that contribution to nhs commissioned healthcare um, in fact, of course, the vast majority of our psychological professions now aren't uh, practitioner psychologists uh, um, in the other groups. I just yeah. want to take a step back, if that feels OK. Um, and it would be great. It would be interesting if you didn't mind telling us a little bit about sort of your journey getting there um, in sort of previous or upcoming episodes. We're, we're hoping to highlight that there are very uh, various routes into things and it doesn't have to be a, a sort of single process so it'd be great to hear what your journey was and 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 how you sort of became a psychologist or how you became the senior leader yeah yes gosh well where should we begin um so so one of my first experiences of um of health and care was uh i volunteered while i was at school um working into a um what was at the time called a mental handicap hospital school um so working with um young students with learning disabilities Uh, and uh, that experience was quite formative because I saw some really shockingly 
um, bad and in fact abusive practice. Um, and uh, it made me think this needs to be different. Uh, this is not OK. And um, I guess from there, through a number of other sort of um, jobs that I undertook while I was a student and then graduating, sort of increasingly became interested in how can health and care be as good as it can be. Yeah. Um, so that it really gives that good service to people. Um, so I worked as a care assistant uh, in an epilepsy um, assessment unit hospital, um, which was a fascinating job. Um, I worked as a research assistant after that um, on a project looking at the health impacts of unemployment after the uh, PIT closure program mm -hmm. in the 1990s. Um, and uh, through all of those experiences, I suppose, I, I sort of, I never wanted to be a psychological professional, <laughs> but I kind of realised I'd gathered the experiences that actually yeah. uh, set me in a direction where it would make sense um, to explore that uh, option. And so I was very fortunate to um, uh, to get a place as a, uh, on clinical psychology training at um, Salomon's. Um, and uh, so undertook my training, had a very strong sort of learning disability focus during my training. Um, and I think that has always made me sort of focus a lot on kind of systemic factors around individuals. So how how does a system need to change yeah. to make things better for the individual receiving the care? Um, and uh, my first job after um, qualification was also in learning disability mm. services where I worked for about four years. Alongside with, uh, of that, I sort of developed a strong interest in psychological therapies as well. Um, and those two things together, I suppose, have sort of um, carried me through, have been a bit of a thread through my career, both that sort of systemic take on how do we change the system to make it work for people, and then this sort of the recognition, I suppose, that psychological therapies can really, is one of the things that can really change people's lives. Yeah. Um, and having seen that um, as a practitioner, wanting that to be available to more people, yeah. Um, and so I suppose put those two things together and you end up with a bit of a sort of emergent mission of wanting to change the system to make psychological health care more widely available. A vision for the psychological professions. This vision for the PPN is to transform lives and communities by extending and embedding psychological knowledge and practice across the whole of health and care. Part of this vision includes uniting and increasing diversity in psychological professions. To work towards this aim, the Psychological Professions Network South East commissioned Professor Margot out of Southampton University to develop an EDI audit tool. The aim of this tool is for psychological training programmes, NHS trusts and other eligible bodies to evaluate their own equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives within the context of the underrepresented groups based on the Equality Act 2010. The tool can be used to support the development of EDI strategies based on clear expectations clear targets and the ability to rate progress. The tool covers a range of protected characteristics. The tool is really easy to use and runs off of a RAG system rating red, amber and green and can be used to develop and review action plans based on the same system. The EDI audit tool is free and available for any services to use by visiting the PPN Southeast webpage, clicking on resources and then EDI tool. Let's work together to unite and increase diversity in the psychological professions. So from that learning disability job, I moved into a job 
working in a training um, program um, and I was uh, involved in both clinical psychology training and then establishing um, a couple of the first at the, at the time improving access to psychological therapies now NHS talking therapies education programs um, and so uh, sort of have gradually been on this process I think of trying to make an impact at a slightly wider scale so yeah. that became about training more people and then from there I went back into the NHS um, full-time um, again in a sort of training role so focused on workforce how can we help our workforce have the biggest impact um, and had the opportunity to take on the sort of regional role um, running a regional mental health project in Kent Surrey Sussex uh, for um, Health Education England and so that was again an opportunity to try and influence at a slightly bigger scale so I was in a trust and then I was doing this sort of regional work um, from there applied to be to um, a role as a clinical advisor on the NHS Talking Therapies program so that became a sort of national um, level of trying to trying to make an impact and and from that role um, was quite quickly asked to add to my portfolio to do more stuff uh, at a national level and I think the reason for that is there was a big gap there actually hadn't been a um, sort of professional lead for the psychological professions in right. either the Department of Health or uh, successor organisations NHS England since about 2004 I think so there'd been a, a sort of 15 year or so gap um, oh, and uh, and there was a lot that needed to be done so um, there was work at the time looking at sort of new roles in the psychological professions. It became apparent you can't really just develop new roles without thinking about the existing roles and how they need to be um, sort of uh, embedded and how everything needs to work in synergy. So um, I was sort of asked to take on this broader portfolio, managed to um, do some things during that time like uh, embedding a sort of plan into something called the interim people plan which came out back in hmm, I'm going to say 2018 2019 Sounds um, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a sort of uh, plan for workforce in the NHS and we managed to uh, write into it that there needed to be more work for the, on the psychological professions and um, to grow them to develop them and to um, support their best leadership at all levels in the system and so there we had a sort of win in terms of a policy, um, a bit of policy being written about the psychological professions and the need for that work to be done. Um, and then really leading on from there, cut a long story short, well, actually, I haven't cut it that short. Um, <laughs> uh, to, leading on from there, that led to the creation of the post that I then applied for and am now in. Um, and so that post being to deliver on that agenda um, of grow, develop and lead um, in the psychological professions. Gosh, it sounds like such a journey. One of the things that's jumped out at me is a lot of people that have made such brilliant progress in psychological professions. It's interesting how a lot of the those people have said psychology wasn't something I wanted to do. It wasn't mm. something I was looking at doing. Mm. I just kind of fell that way. And I think that really, for me, shows that working in a psychological field, you know, it takes sort of something that's quite embedded in you it takes a certain sort of characteristic a compassion a real fight to want things to be better and different and, mm. and it definitely sounds like that's something that's stuck with you throughout your entire journey this yes absolutely I mean I think that's really the beating heart of the work um is is wanting things to be different wanting things to be better and um you know it's then about finding well, what are the what are the various vehicles through which I could do that and of course there are many there's many different ways of making the world a better place. Um, but I think that is the, the driving force, yeah. I guess um, I guess I'm thinking, you know, every time people explain their journey, it always sounds so fluid. It always sounds so, I don't know, kind of easy. Um, and that's not always happened, right? So I guess, have there been any um, sort of times where you've sat and you've thought oh god this is just isn't going to happen this isn't going to work yeah many 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 times so and of course <laughs> you know you you sort of look back um and tell this story and it, it creates a kind of narrative as if this was all just a sort of path that was laid out 
Um, yeah. But of course, at each step in that path, I didn't half the time know what I was, where I was going or what I wanted to do. And, you know, particularly those earlier stages. Um, yeah, didn't didn't really have a clue on this direction. It was just making making the next decision about what next. Um, and, and then those things started adding up to something. Um, yeah. So it's it, it's important, actually, that in telling the story, we don't give the impression that it's all, you know, easy yeah, <laughs> or laid absolutely. out. You know, it's full of full of uncertainty and pitfalls and uh, difficulty. Um, I think that I've got a really good colleague, close colleague, who um, once said to me something that's really stuck with me, which is he used to think that um, his sort of work was about sort of overcoming or stepping over the stones in the road. It's like you're yeah. trying to go around the stones in the road <laughs> that are blocking your path. And then he realised actually the stones were the road. And that, that's really oh, that's stayed cool. with me. It's kind of... Um, you know, yeah. our task is to overcome difficulty, actually, whether that's um, in our own personal career journey or in the journey of trying to make things better. Um, so it's not going to always feel easy. That's quite a profound sort of visual image in a, in a mind, isn't it? Actually, I think when we look back on journeys, our journeys, it's, easy, it, you know, we explain them in this really fluid way because that's kind of what we, as a psychological profession, you're kind of trained to do that, right, is make everything into sort of a nice formulation or a nice journey and actually like you said it's really important for us to recognize that that's not always the road and there's twists and there's turns and mm. hard bits and, and mistakes you know we all make yeah. mistakes and that's that's okay too and and as we're talking I guess it re leads sort of really nicely into the next thing that I wanted to ask you which was you have so much to do and you're doing so much stuff you've got this huge mission that can't always be easy to do what keeps you connected to the your, your sort of core values in that yeah this is a really interesting question um and i think there's a lot of different ways of looking at it what i suppose one way is i don't think you can do the work without the core values i mean mm -hmm. i think you couldn't carry on so yeah um uh it takes the you know the values are the engine they're the that's what drives it and for me those are about always you know thinking about the impact on patient service user carers and families um that's the priority um but there, it's also about working together a sort of um you know a collective voice in a way that um sort of best serves the public rather than lots of sort of fragments of psychological professions fighting amongst themselves I think those are two kind of core core elements of it for me. Without those, I don't think I could do the job. Um, the, the energy just wouldn't be there. So that's one part of it. But what are the kind of sustaining things that keep the keep those values and that energy going? I suppose really important is all the rest of the teams that I work with. And so, you know, great people working in each of the regions in the PPNs, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, great people working in the policy teams at NHSE, um, you know, really very able people in, in all of these different teams. And and that's hugely energy providing um, because we always can achieve far more together than as an individual. Um, and so it's much more important, I think, to think about what can we do together. Sounds like when you know you're falling off of those stepping stones when things are feeling a bit hard you know thinking about all of these teams working with these people around you sounds like it really gives you that little bit of sort of like positive energy back it let's face it the nhs at the moment you know is it is it's a tough place to work for a lot of very yeah. different varying different reasons and and trying to change that landscape at the moment has got to be at an all-time tough so yeah, yeah keeping those people in mind sounds really important for you yeah, definitely. Um, it is a really tough time and it's a really tough time for sort of pushing forward with change um, and keeping energy up. And so we do need each other. And, we, yeah. you know, I, I sometimes think about it as sort of like a peloton in a bike race. You know, you need different people at yeah. the front at different times, leading different things. It can't, it, you know, no one person has the energy to carry the whole peloton yeah um and and so it's really important that we 
we sort of recognise it's a team sport, what we're trying to do. I was, won- I was wondering how long it would take us to get to a sport metaphor, Adrian, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're a few minutes in. We haven't done badly. We have not That's done badly. That's only one. <laughs> I'll take the one. I'll take the one. <laughs> My last sort of question to you, and it's always the one that is my favourite, is if you think back on that sort of whole journey that we've just spoke about, all those values, everything that we've talked about, what is something that you wish you knew or something that you would tell somebody else at the beginning of their journey when you think back on everything that you've done and all the experiences that you've had? Mm. Well, I suppose building on some of the conversation we've had, I would say, you know, know that the difficult experiences can be part of building something better, um, both yeah. for yourself and for the public. Um, so it's, you know, difficult experiences are important part of growth. Um, I think that's one thing. I, I guess I'd also, you know, come back to the the stones are the road. I think that's a really important um, sort of thing to hold in mind. Uh, we can sort of live in this kind of fantasy that we want it to be easy, but the job isn't easy. What we're trying to do isn't easy. We're trying to do something really difficult, which is either create change with individuals or with families or with groups or with systems and with policy. These things aren't easy. Um, And so we shouldn't expect them to be easy. We should expect it to be a struggle and that that is the task. And so then the question is, how do we keep our sort of energy and momentum going in that task? Um, and I guess the final one uh, I would say is really more about senior leadership, which is uh, don't expect that you'll achieve consensus. Um, <laughs> we, this should seem obvious to anyone listening to this, probably. Uh, but I think we're very programmed as psychological professionals to want to achieve consensus. It's kind of core to some of the things that we do. You know, if we're working yeah. with a family or a group or a a team um, that we might be really trying to understand everyone's perspective and bring all the perspectives into the centre and try and sort of find a common path. Um, sometimes in senior leadership, you can't find consensus. And so then it's how do you find a common way forward that best serves the public, even though people might not all agree on how to get there? Um, yeah. So I, I think perhaps, you know, there's elements of that across a whole range of different jobs as well where we need to. Perhaps just think sometimes what's the what's the sort of driving end goal, the core end goal of this? And it has to be about the public rather than about us all agreeing. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's funny you're sort of talking about consensus and and all I get is my dad's sort of voice in my mind in a very sort of um, down to earth way. Him just sort of screaming at me is you're never going to please everybody. Just do what you think is best. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's always sort of something that that stuck with me and and I guess that's kind of the root of what, what you're saying is it's about figuring out what the best path is but you're not always always going to please everybody all at the same no. time we're we're too complex of uh, a working network aren't we with, with of course and there. you know the, the diversity of opinion and uh, is really helpful and good um uh and and we need to use that and understand it but yeah um sometimes we need to make decisions and we should base that on all of that different opinion that we're receiving but um we can't necessarily please everyone all of the time your dad's right yeah oh don't, don't say that on in public <laughs> we'll never get him through another door frame um and i guess my my sort of final thing before you know thank you absolutely for not speaking to us it's been such an interesting conversation and um and I guess the mission goes on and you can be part of that mission anyone who's listening by joining the PPN and just really inputting everything that you want to say or your points of view into the PPN that thank you so much for joining us and um we'd love to get you back on sort of later on and 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 see what else you're doing and, and what's what's happening next brilliant thank you so much for having me That was Dr. Adrian Whittington, who is the PPN Southeast co-chair and the national clinical lead for psychological professions. In our next episode, we'll be talking to Matthew Beaton. Matthew is an MHWP, which is a mental health 
and wellbeing practitioner, course lead in one of the Southeast region course providers. Matthew will be talking to us about his journey into the psychological professions. He'll be talking about um, starting a journey in one area of psychological professions and moving to another. He'll also be talking to us about the MHWB course and how you can apply and join that psychological profession. If there is a certain role, a certain professional, if there's topics or issues that you want to hear about and you would like us to discuss on this podcast, feel free to message us on X, formerly known as Twitter, or LinkedIn. You can also email us and all of these details are in the podcast notes below. Please remember to sign up as a PPN member. You can do this via the website by clicking on the register button. Membership is completely free and you'll have access to newsletter updates, NHS information, updated policies, and much more. There'll also be access to PPN run events, which are free too. We welcome the voices of everybody. So whether you're an NHS professional, a person with lived experience, carer, somebody working in psychological professions outside of the NHS, or someone who's just generally interested in NHS commissioned psychological services, we want to hear all of your voices in Adrian's mission of change. So please come join us and give us your points of view. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast. We have really enjoyed this episode and it's been great to share it with you. So thank you. We hope that you have a lovely week and we'll see you soon.